I just had this wonderful conversation with Tisha Richmond, and it was kind of interesting to see how we first connected. I actually didn't know this. Uh, years ago, Tisha actually saw me speak in an event in Miami called Miami Device. This is probably around 2015. And she said she was really inspired to try some new things. And I didn't know this until she shared this with me in the podcast, which was, you know, very humbling, very kind. But then she also shared this story about how someone at that conference pulled her in to a group to connect with her, where she actually had been there alone and kind of felt like an outsider. And then someone actually pulled her in, said, join us. And she tells a wonderful story about this. And as much as I appreciate she shared that my ideas, the stuff I shared in that keynote inspired her, I don't think she would have done this stuff if it wasn't for that person to actually go out of their way and make that connection. Because we live in this miraculous time where we have all the information in the world. But what I think is more valuable is we have access to one another. And I'm not just talking about how we connect online. I'm talking about in those circumstances where we make our way to make sure people feel included, welcome in different spaces, because there's a lot of people who have really great ideas and are wanting to do something, but they just need someone to support them, to bring them into, you know, a group to make them feel welcome. And as much as I love that story she, she shared about my impact, I don't think she would have done much without the other person. And I think that was a really powerful story. And it reminds us that we need to go out of our way to help people feel welcome and appreciate and open ourselves up to learning from anyone, no matter whether we know them or not, where they are in their career, whether they've left the career, whether they're starting. I think there's so many great opportunities. And Tisha does a really great job talking about this idea and how we can make learning magical, how you can take ideas from anything in the world, from any discipline, but you're the expert. How do you make them your own? And how do you use those ideas to really benefit not only kids, but open up doors for yourself as well? I know you're going to love this episode of the Innovators Mindset podcast. I love to hear from your learning. So if you could just like and subscribe and comment down below, what was your big takeaway? We'd love to hear from you because every time someone comments, it, it really helps build not only this community, but I know people are listening. They're learning from this as well. And sometimes they share this stuff and I have no idea. And I think those comments actually um, really make a difference, not only to myself, but the people that um, join me for this time. And so I would love to hear from you. And I appreciate you all being here today. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm so blessed to have my friend here today, Tisha Richmond. Tisha and I uh, uh, had first connected years ago at a conference in Miami, Miami Device. I was lucky enough to speak there. And uh, I'm going to ask you, you shared a really powerful story about uh, a, a mutual friend that we have, Rodney Tuner. I'm going to ask you to share that in a second. Um, mm -hmm. But Tisha is actually the author of the book, Make Learning Magical. She works at a school district in Southern Oregon, you said, right, you know, on the border of California there, or close to anyway, um, works with Canva as well and splits those roles and also um, is a speaker. So does a, a, a ton of different roles and still found time to be on the podcast, <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. So Tisha, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. And if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do today and how you got there. It's a great place to start. Absolutely. Thank you, George. It's an honor to be here, truly. So I have been in education almost 30 years. I think it's going on 27. Most of those years were teaching career and technical education. I taught culinary arts. I taught interior design and then moved into a tech integration district role in 2018, I believe. And now I'm working in my district as a student engagement and professional development specialist this year, 50% time. And then my other 50% of my time, I am working as a Canva for education learning consultant. And so I get to provide free professional development to districts when they onboard Canva for education. And uh, I love all of my roles so much. Uh, I also do love to speak. 
And I just had kind of a whirlwind adventure of going to some different conferences and getting ready to go on another speaking engagement in another week and a half or so. But just truly feel grateful for this journey that I have been on. And really that journey started that year that I met you, George, at Miami Device, and you were a pivotal part of that journey and, and me really looking differently at education. And so I, I am very reflective and very grateful for the path that it has led me down. And I, and I, and I love that. And it was that, that was a pretty big uh, conference for me. I really enjoyed my time and a lot of amazing people I'm still connected with, like Phil, Felix Iacobino and uh, you know, many other people from that district, but you actually, um, we were talking before, cause I was just looking at, you know, some of the comments on your books and I saw Ronnie Turner was one of the people that endorsed your book. Yeah. And I'm like, I haven't heard from Ronnie Turner in a while. And Rodney was, is like one of the nicest people I've ever met. He's super kind. And then you told me a story about Rodney, which to be honest, you did not surprise me at all, like yeah. zero. And so can you share that story with everybody? Cause I think it was pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I have to let you know that I, that year that I went to Miami Device was a kind of a rock bottom year for me. I was contemplating leaving education. I was burnt out. I was frustrated. iPads had come into my class. No one else was one to one iPads. I had no idea what to do with them. And so as part of me trying to figure it out, I wanted to go to some conferences. And so I had first gone to iPad Palooza. I had found out there is this world of being connected and I saw this, this contest to win a trip to Miami device right. in Miami, Florida. I'm like, what a cool name of a conference. I'm going to go for it. I've learned some kind of cool stuff at iPad Palooza. Like I'm just going to put, because you basically had to say like you had to create something saying why you want to go to this conference and you had to share it out on social media. So I'm like, okay, like I, I think I've got this. I've learned some things like what do I have to lose really? Right. So I put in this submission, one, a trip to Miami device. And wow, so I, I went, that. yeah. So I went to Miami device, um, knowing no one. So I had started lurking on Twitter, like kind of figuring out what this connected world of an edu of being an educator was all about, but really had not connected much. I was just trying to figure it out. And so I went to Miami device and it was, it's an amazing conference. It was kind of a, a small, really cool venue but everybody there seemed to know each other. Everybody seemed to be talking and laughing and gathering around the lunch area. And so this little country girl from Oregon was standing kind of on the, the periphery of this lunch, kind of going, oh my gosh, like, I don't know that I belong here. Like, I don't, I don't know anyone. All these people seem to know each other. And Rodney Turner came up to me. I remember him hooking my arm and saying, come meet my friends. And so he took me to all of these groups of people that were gathered on the grass there at the lunch um, in the lunch area and introduced me to all of his friends. And in that moment, I felt like I belonged, like I was a part of this educational community that um, that I was just starting to get to know. And so that was really the moment for me where now it was making sense, right? Like I had gotten connected on Twitter. I was starting to lurk and follow people, starting to make some connections, but this made it come to life for me. And from there on out, now I had people to connect with on social media that I actually had met and mm -hmm. I had a connection with. And then the growth in so many areas of my educational life just was exponential. And so I, I always, I love sharing that story. I love shouting out Rodney Turner because I don't know, I think if he wouldn't have come up to me in that moment, it's a good chance that I would have gotten back to my hotel room and just called it a day right. because I didn't feel like I was maybe a part or maybe I didn't belong. So yeah, just, that's, a, that's such a, that's such a powerful story. And like, I, I, I think about that quite a bit. And I, you know, a lot of people follow me on Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. And you know, that's, that's awesome. And I, and I love that. One of the things I'm most proud of is when I'm someone's first follower that, mm -hmm. that makes me like that, that is something that gets me really excited. And a lot of times I'll just kind of look, you know, who followed me recently. And I, I typically, if you're an educator, I'll follow you back. And I'll just look at some accounts and I'll see like someone with zero followers. I'm like, okay, this, this person, I want them to see someone followed them, 
right? Like someone yeah. connected with them and, um, you know, because a lot of times it is a daunting thing to go into those spaces um, yeah. and share. I actually remember one time uh, I, I like basically highlighted someone and uh, I'll never forget this. I highlighted someone and I said, hey, this person's new and they have this question. And then, you know, they got some responses. They were really excited. And then someone shared a snarky response. I'm like, oh, they're, they're probably never going to go back on right now because they're going to mm -hmm. think this is the experience, right? And there's more right. of that good than there is that bad. And so, you know, kudos to Ronnie Turner because you you, you did. Here's, here's the thing. I think this is part of it too. You did have to show up to the conference, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, well, how come I'm not you know, part of, you know, this group or whatever, but sometimes it's just because we're looking on the outside, but never actually wanting to kind of step in. Right. And I think right. we have to have that courage to kind of, you know, say hi or do whatever, but sure. it's, you know, always seeing people there too, to, you know, make sure that we, we bring as many people along for the ride as well. So I, I love that story. And Rodney, um, like I said, does not surprise me over Rodney at all. He's a very kind man. And um, has gone out of his way over the years to be very friendly with me too. So I, I really appreciate that. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, and I asked you if this is okay uh, before, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, that you work part-time, you know, contracting, you speak part-time and I, you know, like I, I say part-time, like these are all things mm -hmm. you do. Plus you work with a district because I know a lot of people, um, wish they had that opportunity and i work with a lot of people that basically the district says to you we want you a hundred percent of the time or zero percent of the time like you have to make mm -hmm. a decision and it seems pretty you know amazing that people have the vision you know to to kind of give you some of that flexibility now i will be honest with you if you're a classroom teacher is a little bit harder if you're around yeah. kids every single day um but when you work in like a central office position it's a little bit different because Sometimes you have to do paperwork and that sucks, but you can do paperwork on a plane, right? Yeah. And that's reality. So like, how, how does that work for you? Like how, how is juggling, you know, the, the, the multiple roles, um, but still, you know, honoring your district. Yeah. I'm super grateful for my district for giving me that flexibility, but I think most importantly, valuing me as a leader, as an educator, and knowing that when I go and when I speak and when I go to conferences, I'm going to be bringing back that value to my district. And that is not something that is going to go to waste. I mm -hmm. am continuously learning, not only from going to sessions, but just as you know, those connections, those people oh. that you talk to over meals or you talk to in the hallway, you get to dive deeper into maybe what they do and some of the, the issues and the problems that you're tackling in your own districts, you're able to kind of talk those things through. And so my perspective has changed so much over the years as I have become connected on social media, but as I have been able to go out and be able to be a part of, of these conferences and speaking engagements. And so um, my district has seen that I have these opportunities to speak and they really have valued um, my time and, mm -hmm. and me as a leader in saying, you know what, we, we will have you 50% and we will also let you do 50% what you need to do with Canva for Education, speaking, whatever it might be. And we trust you that you are going to give us your 50% and you're going to, to work that out. And so I do have kind of days that I clock in in the district. Um, and there are days where I have to flex that a little or weeks that I have to flex that a little bit, but it's worked out really, really well. And it's allowed me to be able to just be able to work in all of my passion areas. There's so many things that I love to do and I love to get to share my message and my heart for education. And so having that flexibility has just really enabled me to do that. And, and I know that it's rare and I'm so, so grateful right. it for is it. Mm -hmm. It is rare. And, and the, you know, as, as you're talking, the, the one thing we were kind of talking about before the podcast, the reality of it is when you are working for a district and you have that role, one of the things that I found, cause I had something very similar, you know, I was like 0 0.9, mm -hmm. 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, you know, that kind of that role. But I would go to these events where I was invited to speak or do workshops, whatever. 
And that was, you know, my day. That wasn't a district day. That was, mm-hmm. that was my day. But what was really powerful is that I'm a learner and I pick up great ideas from these amazing yeah. people that my district paid zero dollars for. Right. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden I take those ideas, bring them back, modify them to my district and they benefit as opposed to them paying for me to go to a conference and stuff like that too. And right. when you say, when you say, you know, um, here, here's, here's the other part and I'm making an assumption here. I guarantee you that even though you have X amount of hours that you're expected to put in, I guarantee you put in more and probably part of it, you know, maybe doing stuff on the side for your district, re, you know, doing extra stuff because you feel that value. You want to make sure that yeah. you kind of go above and beyond the expectation, not just like, Hey, sorry, that you, Hey, you can't talk to me until I show up on Monday. Right? Like that's my district time. And I think a lot of people don't realize that because if you, if people, feel really valued through that process. They, they go above and beyond, but when they're kind of diminished and, you know, I, I think that like, I, I just wish more districts would be open to that because I, you know, they, it is kind of fascinating people that kind of hundred percent or zero, as opposed to like, Hey, can we benefit from this person? Um, part of it too, because they have, they bring such value to our district but right. also really inspire them just the way we, you know, want kids to have some flexibility in those options as well. So hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So good, good for your district. Um, you, you said, you said you, you, you do some work with uh, Canva and mm-hmm. I, I, so this is not an ad. This is not a promotion. <laughs> I'm just talking about this. So I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying this legitimately Canva is like probably, you know, people are going to be probably commenting on this because as soon as they hear the word Canva, they're all <laughs> excited. And Canva is like, you know, such a big deal in education. People really appreciate, you know, what they can do with that product. So like what it, what is, so for those people who are, are listening, who don't know what it is, um, and can you tell us a little bit what Canva is and like why it's beneficial to, you know, uh, educators and students? Absolutely. So Canva for Education is a visual communications platform. Canva was born in 2013. And so it was primarily at that time created for the business sector. And then about two years ago, Canva for Education was born. And basically they wanted all students, all educators to have access to Canva for Education for free. So essentially you're getting all the bells and whistles of Mm -hmm. Canva premium at no cost to you as an educator, to you as a student. And so they will roster an entire district and bring all the staff students into that platform. And you are getting all of the benefits of having integration with your single sign-on, with your learning management system. You're getting all of these premium features for free. You also can just go to canvaforeducation.com and sign up for a free educator account if your district isn't rostered and you can access all the premium right. Canva for Education features as well. But what I really love about Canva for Education is that it empowers students to demonstrate what they know in multiple endless ways. So students are able to create, they're able to collaborate with their peers, teachers are able to give that real-time feedback you can make videos, you can make infographics, you can make book covers, t-shirt logos. In my culinary class, I mean, this was not available. Camera for Education wasn't available when I was teaching culinary arts, but I still had my students go into the basic pre camera for education version when things were still like you had to pay for them because students would go in and make their recipes and their menus and their logos for their food trucks. And they were loving it. And so now, I mean, Thinking about ways that students can really get to uh, show what they know is is incredible. And there's also a lot of really cool features that are built into Canva that I would I used to go elsewhere for. For Mm -hmm. instance, like a QR code creator. You can make that right within Canva with like a click of a button. Mm -hmm. You can remove the background from a photo. You can remove the background from a video. So you can essentially record in Canva or grab a video from the Canva for Education Library and then remove the background. So it's kind of almost like a green screen capability built in. And then infinite ways to layer um, different, like you can create a design and then you can go in and record yourself talking about that design. And so when I think of that and how, and when I've witnessed, like I've gone into classrooms in my own district and I've seen 
kids just come alive because now all of a sudden they've been given this creative freedom to really get to show what they know in the way that speaks to them. It's so powerful. And so that is why I do what I do. That is why I split my time is because I believe so much in this platform uh, to just really provide those experiences for students where they can really create, collaborate, critically think, communicate, like all those yeah. things that we always talk about, they're all, they're able to do all of those things within within Canva for education. I, I feel like you, you could, you know, you, you got a little time working there. You did such a good pitch for the company. So, <laughs> right. So that should count part of, as part of your right. work time. Right. So right. I can yeah. say, yeah. Like, yeah, okay, I'm I, writing that down. Yeah. <laughs> I did this. This is part of that too. Yeah. And that, just so you know, I, you know, I'm a junk professor at UPenn. So I'm kind of expecting my, I've been trying to get an educator account and they won't give me one. So I'm just throwing that out there, Canva. Just saying, <laughs> if, you, if you know anybody that could hook me up with an educator account, I, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So, I, I love that that idea of um, giving kids the ability to like create and share information in different ways, right? Because uh, I've said this before. Sometimes what we do with our students is that we don't assess our kids' understanding of science. We assess our kids' ability to write their understanding yeah. of science. And so sometimes, you know, there, there's different things that, you know, maybe contribute like um, that are a little bit harder. Maybe sometimes uh, writing is not the best way for someone to communicate for them uh, their understanding of something, whereas sometimes that's the best way. And so you exactly. have these different opportunities to share learning, um, you know, and mm -hmm. one of the questions over the years I've got is like, well, how do you assess that kid's creation? I'm like, you don't assess the creation, you assess the kid's understanding of you know that maybe your objective or whatever but there's different ways to explain that then you know everyone must give this uh i think chris lehman talks about this idea of that if you give an assignment and you get 30 things of the same back it, it, it's like a you basically create gave them a recipe not you know didn't give them any time to like really you know create something meaningful to them so i i love that so let's talk about your book, um, Make Learning Magical. I see it was published in September of 2018. So it's like almost five years old. It seems yeah. really quick. Right? I, like, I remember it felt like just yesterday that actually came out. So I that's know. pretty cool. So I know that um, even though it was written five years ago, a lot of the messages and the ideas shared in it are still relevant to this day. So if you can give just people a quick synopsis of your book, tell us what it's about and kind of maybe what you hope to achieve um, from, from what you wrote in it. Absolutely. So it kind of told you the very beginning of, of my story about how I was a te teacher who was burnt out. I was frustrated. I was thinking about leaving education. And then these iPads came into my classroom and I had to figure out, OK, I don't want them gathering dust. I want them to be used in transformational ways. But I honestly had no idea what that would look like in a class where my students were cooking. I just didn't know. And so that kind of started me on this journey of learning and going to conferences, going to iPad Palooza, going to Miami Device, getting connected as an educator, really learning what this this edu Twitter was all about and what it meant to learn from others that were outside of my realm of culinary arts. Because up until that point, like I was going to bakery workshops, like I was going to Johnson and Wales and learning like how to make mother sauces. Like I had never been to a conference where I was learning these strategies that were um, being used in classrooms across grade levels, content areas. And so when I started connecting and started to really reach out to other educators, I realized, wow, I don't have to live in a silo anymore in my little culinary arts bubble. I can actually learn from educators that are in all other subject areas, all other grade levels, take those ideas, mm -hmm. Think about what that would look like in my world and make them my own. And so it just really began this journey of realizing there was so much more in education that I, I wasn't aware of, that I had never even considered. And a lot of that journey was about stepping out there, out of my comfort zone, and totally almost dismantling what I was doing mm -hmm. and rethinking what classroom learning could look like in my classroom. And so I, I realized at that time that I, I mean, I was going through the motions. Like I had things dialed in, like I had all of my lessons figured right. out. Like I had been doing this for quite a while, but there was no joy in it for me. 
Um, I actually had a sign that was by my classroom door that said, above all, have a good time. And I remember one day looking at that sign and realizing, wow, like I have this mm -hmm. sign that's telling my students to have a good time and I'm actually not having a good time. And so that was really kind of eye opening to me. And so I started reworking the way that my workflow looked in my classroom. I started really um, taking risks, jumping out of my comfort zone, inviting my students on that learning adventure with me and saying, hey, I don't have all the answers. I found these cool things. I think I have a good plan, but let's do this together and let's see what this looks like. And it just it just allowed me to enjoy teaching again. And I, I found that my spark and my excitement for teaching was coming back as I was able to explore these new ideas and and approach education in a new way where students were not only engaged in my content, but they were becoming empowered learners. And so in that process of kind of rediscovering and taking risks and rethinking learning, I realized that I had really kind of unlocked these keys that really transformed me as a teacher, but also was creating these unforgettable experiences for students. And so MAGICAL is actually an acronym. And so M stands for memorable beginnings. And so just thinking about that moment students walk into our classroom at the beginning of a semester, even at the beginning of a day, like how are we greeting them? How are we creating those memorable experiences for students so they so that they get hooked on the learning, but that we are also really building those relationships with them? A is for authenticity and agency. So how can we bring our true selves into our teaching and how can we help our students be their true selves as learners in our classroom and really creating that safe space? And then um, agency is just that choice. Like how can I open up options for students on how they're expressing themselves, how they're expressing their learning? Gamified experiences is huge. I gamified my classroom from beginning to end really inspired by reality game shows like The Amazing Race, The Great Food Truck Race, um, MasterChef. I really created this theme and was able to bring in these game elements to really create this very immersive experience for my students. And so that really changed the way um, that I approached teaching in my classroom. I is for innovation. And again, uh, largely inspired by you, George, and and what I learned about being um, innovative and how I can help my students be innovative too. Uh, C, creativity, curiosity, and collaboration. Like how can we spark that excitement and curiosity about learner that, about learning for our students so that they want to learn? Like I want students when they leave my classroom to want to learn for a lifetime. Yeah. I wanna spark that excitement about cooking so that no matter if they're in the industry or whether they're cooking dinner for their family 20 years from the time they leave my class, I want them to keep asking questions. I want them to keep being curious about cooking and, and want to enjoy that for, for a lifetime. And so how can I spark that in my classroom? How can I provide opportunities for them to work together and to collaborate? How can I give them new opportunities to create? An example, um, it made me think of when you're talking about the recipe, when my students had a, um, a unit, we had a unit challenge every every unit at the end. And so we would do like pies and pastries, soups and sauces. And so what I would tell my students is I would tell them they're going to have a challenge. I'm going to give you the formula, but I'm not giving you the directions. So you're going to have to make like, let's say it's a pie crust. I want you to make a pie crust with the formula. You're going to have to demonstrate that method as a team. And then I want you to turn it into something amazing, something that will blow the judge's mind. And then I brought in an authentic audience of judges to That's give awesome. them feedback. And it was powerful because they realized in that moment, wow, I really do know how to do this. And yeah. I can actually make it something that I can own and is something that is reflective of me. And it was amazing to see what students would come up with. And I honestly would tear up almost every time because just to see their growth as they got used to uh, demonstrating their learning in that way was, was really powerful. And that leads me into authentic audience. Every single unit, I would invite an authentic audience into my classroom. Sometimes it was food truck owners, sometimes it was chefs, sometimes it was the school custodian and secretaries and principals and other teachers. And that gave my students an opportunity to shine in front of an audience that they normally wouldn't have had an opportunity to shine in front of. They could demonstrate their learning in front of me, but really what they didn't care, right? Like I can give them feedback, but that wasn't super right. exciting. But when I brought in this authentic audience of people that were giving them real relevant feedback, sometimes from the industry, sometimes from the English teacher 
that they really struggled in that class, but then they were able to see them shine in my class. That was powerful for students and to see their growth from one challenge to another as they really up their skills and their articulation of how they were sharing and, and the way that they were collaborating as a team was amazing. Like it just changed the way that my students not only learned in my class, but um, it really allowed them to become courageous in their learning and really confident in their learning, which was really, really powerful to see. And then legacy is the L of magical. And that is just how we as educators can leave a legacy in this world as um, in our profession, but then also how as educators, we can empower our students and help them to go into the world and leave their own legacies. And so those are kind of the, the elements that really transform things for me. And my hope was that I know that everybody has their own magic. My magic is not your magic, is not some right. other educators' magic, but really to empower educators to find their own magic. And hopefully some of the strategies, the things that I was able to do to unlock that in my class will be helpful and can be applied to other people's classrooms in some way. So first of all, shout out for remembering all that. <laughs> <laughs> or do it each one. That's pretty impressive. The so as I'm listening to you, I was thinking a couple of things. The, the first thing is, and you you really hit it at the end there. Uh, I was thinking about how in culinary arts when I took that, and we called it home ec, right? Yeah, I don't know, yeah. I don't know, it's essentially, yeah. Right. So that was what it was when I was when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and you you would have to eat you would, the, the, the excitement was eating what you made, right? Yeah. Like that was an exciting thing. Now I'm like a pizza guy, right? So <laughs> I like, me too. so I'm a, you know, I like pizza. I, I'm like, you give me pizza over any gourmet dish. I'm taking pizza. Right. right, and right. I, I don't drink alcohol, but give me iced tea. I'll take iced tea all day. <laughs> and I'm not talking us iced tea, right? That's, that's a whole, not sweet. I'm talking Canadian iced tea, whatever that is. Oh, okay. So, so one of the one of the things I was thinking about is one of the benefits of that class for me, it was really exciting, was that I wanted to create something that I would actually want to eat at the end. Mm -hmm. So you have to make it good, right? Because you don't want right. to you don't want to like do terrible. And so I was thinking about that in, for example, uh, language arts or an English class. Mm -hmm. Am I actually writing something that I would want to read? And, right. and even like, I think about, um, when I first started blogging, someone was like, Hey, I'm going to help you with your blog. And then they tried to make me write really academically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, no, I'm not, I don't want to do this. This is not me. I I'm a storyteller. I'm not, I'm not going to mm -hmm. write, you know, really high, um, academic PhD type writing. It's just not my right. style. And if I would have done that, I would have quit my blog. And I think part of that too, when I, so when I think about that, do we get kids to do things, not in just culinary arts, but in every class that they would want to partake in after? Cause that, that is some of the magic and it might not be what, you know, and part of it too, is that I was kind of thinking like, okay, what about if, you know, you are cooking for, you know, a group, do you mm -hmm. want, would you, do you want to please them over yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, would you create something right. that, but the thing is, and I, I'm just reading, um, Seth Godin's book, right. Uh, on this is marketing. And one of the things is that you can't please everybody. So find like the, like the, I think he says the smallest viable audience and, yeah. and, and have those people really passionate about it too, because sometimes we, we get kids to create for an audience that they wouldn't even want to be a part of in that sense. Right. And it's not that that audience is wrong, but someone else is cooking for them, right? Someone else is right. doing that too. And the other thing I thought of when I was listening to you, I think this is, you know, really the kind of, and probably why, you know, the work connected or, uh, and I want to say the work connected to you, but you made the connection yourself is that you take the idea of the innovator's mindset and you connect it to culinary arts. Whereas a lot of times uh, I've seen, well, I teach music and this is not directed specifically yeah. toward music teachers as opposed to saying like hey i'm the expert in music how do i make this connection myself which is actually the epitome of innovators mindset it's not mm -hmm. sometimes we'll say 
Oh, like I, oh, this makes me so mad when I hear teachers say, well, you've only taught for X amount of years. Like, what can I learn from you? I'm like, first of all, you're, you're discouraging someone from sharing their voice. Yeah. Second, you know, at, if you're in it for 30 years and I'm in it for one, we can both learn from each other. We bring different things to the table and uh, you'll, you'll realize this, you know, at some point you probably will, you know, consult or full time. Well, how long you been out of the classroom? Well, Man. I'm not telling you how to teach. But I am sharing my ideas. I trust that you'll make your own solutions. Like you figure this out. I'm just giving you some ideas. You do whatever you want with it. Now, I, I've seen people say like, this is how you should teach. That mm -hmm. I don't like that approach either. But it's really, you make your own learning happen. And I, and I think you did such a great job, you know, kind of talk about that. And so in the book, you just gave kind of the, what each one stands for. But I know that in the book, because I don't want you to tell me anymore. You give, you know, strategies and ideas that people can make their own, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so make sure you check out the book. Uh, it is in the description down below. And um, Nisha, I just want to thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. And yeah, it's so cool. The connections and that we, you know, that we're doing this. And uh, I hope that um, people will follow you. Check out down below. And Tisha, what's like one last piece of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I think it just kind of going off that idea of we all have our own magic. And I think that, again, my magic is not your magic, but get connected, get, um, just find other educators that inspire you, that challenge you, because that's been my journey is just really mm -hmm. connecting with people that push my thinking and, and push my perspective in ways that I hadn't considered before. And then really being able to reflect on that and apply it into my own life, into my own teaching and leading, and then to make to make my own magic from it. So love it. My May, everyone, make sure you follow Tisha. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.